welcome to this introduction to the High Performance Computing Facilities at Queen Mary. Hopefully this will fill in some gaps in your knowledge and answer some questions for existing users and potential users. This introduction will cover important concepts in Section 1 before explaining in Section 2 how to log in and run tasks on a Proctor, the QMUL supercomputer. We're going to start with answering the question, what is a high performance compute cluster? In a nutshell, you could describe a supercomputer as a bunch of computers connected together. These computers are all designed to work flat out at full capacity 24 seven and have some special features. From this point, you may hear me call these computers compute nodes or nodes. These are the machines that do all of the work on a supercomputer. Could a lab of PCs or a rack of servers do the same thing? Well, not exactly. The nodes on a supercomputer are much more tightly coupled than a bunch of networked machines. They all have a common shared storage, typically running a parallel file system. They are configured the same way. Every package and configuration file needs to be consistent. These two points taken together mean that an application which is installed on the shared storage can be expected to run on any of the compute nodes. Servers on the cluster are designed for consistently high performance and usually have lots of compute cores and RAM. The networking hardware is high bandwidth, 25, 40 or even 100 gigabit and there is also low latency hardware for specialized parallel applications. Finally, the machines run a lean Linux operating system tuned for maximum performance. For example, we don't have any superfluous processes running on them that might consume CPU cycles. So with this in mind, the supercomputer is the perfect centralized resource. It has the ability to perform large workloads for many hundreds of users at once, ideally in a fair way and without affecting other users running alongside you. This could be in the form of a small task or thousands of small tasks or large tasks that use multiple machines in parallel. The Epochta cluster is owned by QMUL and is available to QMUL researchers. It currently has around 300 nodes, which equals around 6,000 cores. A core is part of a CPU that functions as a processing unit, performing a task or a workload. As we serve the research needs of the whole university, we do have some different hardware types to serve everyone well. The Epochta cluster gets refreshed regularly, ideally on an annual basis. So while the name stays the same, many of the components have been replaced multiple times over the years. It's important to state that the service is free for all to use. To keep things fair, there are some paid services for those with large exceptional research data storage requirements. Typically, the cluster provides a bunch of nodes that should suit most requirements, plus a smattering of a few specialized ones. There are some research groups who have used grant money to purchase nodes which fit the requirements and are attached to the cluster for their own use. They then benefit from the high performance shared infrastructure underpinning it and we manage it in the same way that we manage the other cluster nodes. In common with all clusters, there is a piece of software called a job scheduler, which ensures that work is executed in an orderly and fair way. More on that later, but essentially you don't need to choose a machine to log on to and run your code, and there's very good reasons for that. This diagram shows the bigger picture of the academic high performance computing scene. Institutional clusters are known as tier three clusters, and sit under larger ones, but each tier performs their own important role. So the role of our institutional cluster is to serve a wide range of users, and usually most of their needs are met with this facility. The tiers above this are for much larger parallel jobs that cannot easily be run on tier three systems. So while we have about 1500 active accounts on the Proctor, there are about 50 Queen Mary users on the tier two systems and a much more narrow range of available applications. Also note that these higher tier systems don't actually have faster hardware, just more of it. And many of the applications that use it are just designed to scale up well to use many computers at once. We pay to be part of consortia, which give access to three tier two systems, typically for doing EPSRC funded work. One of these systems is a GPU cluster. They represent pretty good value for money due to the massive investment that would be required to double or treble the size of a Procta to handle these much larger workloads. The top tiers, such as Archer and Prace, 
require submitting much more formal requests for use. And we do have some Queen Mary researchers that use these resources for massive workloads. Apocto usually gets some new nodes each year, but the whole cluster isn't replaced each time. So we end up with a range of older and newer nodes. It means that some have got faster individual cores. However, that's not the whole picture because the slower cores might be on a large memory node or might be on a node with a large number of cores making it attractive or necessary to use in other ways. That is, your job might not even fit on a smaller node due to RAM requirements. It's important to note that even running on a slightly slower node doesn't imply a longer wait because the queuing time might actually be shorter to get on this node than a faster node. What applications are available on Apocta and how do I get some installed? Well, the operating system is Linux, which has lots of open source research software available has some proprietary software such as MATLAB, ANSYS and others. And you may actually have some of your own bespoke code compiled by your research group or some collaborators. And there is also another method known as containers, which may also be used to run your code. Now we have hundreds of applications available on Apocta already. So you would check to see if your application is available. If not, if it's an appropriate piece of software to put on the cluster, you can ask us via a web form, which creates a ticket for us. Uh, you could also compile your own if it's just for you to use. Also, if you're using Python, Anaconda, R, then there are package managers that will allow you to install those applications yourself if you need to. So how actually does this cluster work? It's all about the job scheduler. All work is given to the job scheduler, which allocates the resources for the job to run. And then it executes it when the resources are available. Doing this ensures that the cluster is used optimally, leaving no free resources unused if there is a job waiting to run. Typically, the cluster is always full, but there is a lot of churn, jobs starting and finishing all the time. It also means that work is queued fairly. When resources are given to you, they are guaranteed. If you request two cores and 10 gigabytes of RAM, that's not shared with anybody. That's one of the reasons why the job scheduler has to handle the resources rather than just letting everyone run processes as they please. To give your job to the job scheduler, you prepare a small file called a job script. It contains the resources required, such as the number of cores, the amount of RAM, how long it's gonna run for. Then you add the commands that you will run. Submit it with a simple command. You don't need to choose the nodes to run on. The scheduler knows what's being used, what's available and where's best to run it. There are also utilities to check what other jobs are in the queue and where your job is in the queue. Diagrammatically, this is what's happening. Users may log in from anywhere using a secure shell session from a terminal application to a front-end server. The user uses a command to send their job script to the scheduler. The scheduler adds the request to a queue and will run a job when resources are ready and there's no earlier jobs in the queue that can be run first. Most small jobs will not spend very long in the queue and many will run immediately. So the various job types we have are, you may have just have a single core job that you may run. You may have a job that uses several cores at once and other jobs may be running on that node at the same time, but you will have guaranteed resources. Some jobs may use a full node and some jobs can use multiple full nodes simultaneously or other jobs may use GPUs for acceleration. So let's look a bit more closely at what happens when you submit a job. Let's simplify the process by assuming we have 10 nodes on the queue with 10 processing cores each. Each compute node is able to run a task. In this situation, we have some full nodes marked by 10 green bars, partially full nodes, and some empty nodes awaiting jobs. We note that since requested resources are guaranteed to you, no over-provisioning is occurring or virtualization of resources. You get exactly what's requested and Linux operating system handles this very well. In this simplification, we're going to assume there's significant RAM available for these jobs. In this example, a user submits a six core job. It can't fit on any of the partially filled nodes. So it goes on the first available node with free resources, i.e. the first node with six free cores. That's node nine. The next job in the queue is a five core job. This could fit on node eight or node 10, but the scheduler tries to fill up nodes first. Otherwise, a larger job would get blocked from running for a long time. For example, if the five core job went on to node 10, 
then a six core job would now be blocked from running on any of the nodes until there was a node with six cores free. Node 8 has five free slots, so it gets executed there. Finally, there are a bunch of five one core jobs. Again, since the scheduler tries to fill up nodes first, this is what the end result is. You can see from this that it's obviously a lot easier to schedule smaller jobs than larger jobs. However, this is a gross simplification and we have about 300 nodes and they've got dozens of cores per node and jobs are starting and finishing all the time. So it's not really that much of an issue unless you are requesting really big resources. Why do we recommend that you consider using the HPC cluster? By using the cluster, you get access to a system that's designed for high performance. The hardware is high end, designed to run at 100% utilization. That's the opposite of standard IT infrastructure, which often poodles along at about 10% utilization and where high load indicates a problem. HPC hardware is designed to run at full capacity all the time. There are many benefits to using an HPC service for small or large jobs. In fact, even if you're running the occasional one core Python tasks, for example, or compiling a small piece of C code, it's good to get into the habit of using the HPC service for any compute tasks. To begin with, moving workload off your personal laptop or desktop device will free up the device for you to get other things done. You are also free from being chained to a single device and become more mobile, since you can interact with the cluster wherever you are. But also, you don't need to babysit the tasks. They join the queue, and if they're small, they should start running really quickly. And otherwise, you can request an email when they start or finish. It's okay to run small jobs in the cluster. Arranging a good workflow will put you in good stead. At some point, you're going to want to run larger workloads. And finally, on the HPC system, we've compiled and tested all the applications for you. So you don't need to install the applications yourself, and you can get reproducible results from using the system that has been tried and tested.